Я расскажу вам. That at the end of the day we realize we have a patient that's underneath our knives and death is waiting for you. And death can happen very easily when you're doing these procedures. And uh, what I want to do is go through some data that goes through uh, that's uh, comparing it to the robot and comparing it to the open procedures. And there have been some developments in this past month that I'll talk about at the end of the, the talk that really needs to make us uh, gain some uh, perspective about what direction we're going in. So basically, how do you determine whether or not a procedure is appropriate or not? And how did we jump to that slobectomy from doing open thoracotomy? And the way I look at it, you review the operative technique itself, right? Common sense, you just look at it and see, does it look any different from how you usually do the procedure? Then you review the public published literature, then you look at your own data. And this is essentially what I have here. So the technique that we use for VATS is a three port it's been well described. I go through all the steps in this article that we had written in the past. And three ports, make sure you get the hip out of the way. And, and basically, you know, the, uh, uh, the superior incision is placed over the superior pulmonary vein. The camera port is placed uh, anteriorly in the anterior axillary line and posteriorly we place this posterior port. And this is essentially what it looks like. And there's a specific way of doing a right upper lobectomy that I find very easy, where you start with the vein and then the truncus, then the bronchus, then the posterior ascending, and then the fissure. This is the way I do it every single time. And when something doesn't go right as I'm doing that sequence, it usually means I'm either too far on the dissection, too much into the parenchyma, or too medial, too much uh, close to the heart. And whenever I can't pass an instrument or I can't get around a structure easily the way that I usually do it, that usually means there's danger waiting there. And I think that for me has worked. That has been a way to keep me safe. And what you find, it's not at the beginning when you're really cautious. It's after you've done 100, 200 cases where you say, oh, this is fine, just boom. And that's when you end up getting into trouble. So this is how I do a right upper lobe. Vein first, truncus, bronchus, posterior ascending, and then the fissure. And when you look at it, all my staplers are passed through that posterior port every single time. And that's the way it's described in that article that, that we wrote in the World Journal of Surgery. And then the bag. And so when you're trying to compare what you're doing, especially when I'm looking at comparing VATS to open to robot, when I look at the VATS procedure, I'm doing it just like I would do an open procedure. I'm through the utility port, I'm holding tissue, and then I'm dissecting behind it. This is exactly the way that I do it in the open procedure. And we come around and we pass our staplers. And then, of course, the small incisions at the end. And everyone's always, you know, concerned about lymph nodes. The lymph nodes, removing all the lymph nodes is not dependent on your technique. It is dependent on your effort. And that's an important take home message. It's that sometimes you want to do an extensive nodal dissection. Sometimes you want to do a sampling, but we need data. When you look at the data in surgery, we have a randomized controlled trial that looked at nodal dissection versus nodal sampling, and there was no difference. And so you have to realize whenever we're looking at the data, whenever we're looking at what we're doing, why are we doing a complete nodal dissection when we know that we have a randomized controlled trial, ACUS-OG Z30, that shows no difference between complete nodal dissection and nodal sampling. So we have to always take into account why are we doing certain things. And then on the left side, we always do it the same way as well. Superior vein, first apical branch, bronchus, lingula, posterior, and then the fissures. All of these staplers placed through the posterior port. And like I said before, if you want a quick summary, 
just go through this uh, to this paper and I go through each lobe individually. So left through there, apical, bronchus, and then the lingular, and then the fissure. I'm not going to go through the videos. Uh, and then we have the, le uh, the left upper lobe nodal packet. And then for the middle lobe, everything is done through the utility. So we make the same three ports, but then when in, whenever you're taking the structures, the vein, the artery, the bronchus, it's all done through the middle, uh, through that utility incision. And what's important as you're doing these dissections, because now I realize that more than half of the people in this room are beginners, is you just have to focus on safety. And the thing that keeps you safe is, let's say you get around this vein, don't right away be happy, oh, I'm around the vein and go ahead and take it. Think what's next, oh, the bronchus. So while you have that vein up there, start to dissect the bronchus, start to think where their artery is. Right when you come around a structure, don't take it right away. It's like chess, you've got to anticipate your next move. Right, so with the middle lobe, you take the vein, bronchus, and then the arteries. And the lower lobectomy, same thing. So I think you're, you're sort of getting the feel of how do you do it. Now, why do it this way? What does the level of evidence tell us? We have three levels of evidence, case series, case control studies, and randomized control studies. So in the case series, this is basically, I've done so many of these and this is our outcome. You see numbers, here you got uh, William Walker, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, his procedure show 11% conversion. And that's an important point. Many of the series that you see don't include the conversions. And the conversions are where the difficult cases happen. Then you have the simultaneous stapling technique, which is not an individual dissection of the hyalur structures. They just take everything and staple it. It's like a big meatball. And what's interesting is even if you do the big meatball procedure, the survival is still 83%. So we talk about you have to do this and you have to do that. In the end, it's survival and recurrence rate that we're looking at. We can say, oh, they have less pain with this. Give me something objective. Let me see how you measured that pain. Because when I was going through and I started doing vasculobectomies 20 years ago, I completely convinced myself of half of these things. Wow, they have less pain, they do so much better. I was completely convinced of that. And then when I looked at the actual data from the institution of what we were doing, it wasn't actually that different. So, of course, one of the biggest series, Rob McKenna, uh, over 1,100 patients. I think now he's up to about 2,000. But then you want to compare it to something else. And what's our standard is open procedure. So with the case control studies, when you look at the past and you look at how many are being compared, 10 VATs, 20 VATs, 18 VATs, and then they're comparing them to open. That's not a lot to compare to. Right, you have this uh, case control study, Watanabe. And when you look at them, the groups aren't exactly equivalent. You have higher stage tumors in the open group. And what you're finding as you look at the data, the open group has the more advanced stages, has the more difficult cases. And when you see that they're not doing as well, are they not doing as well because they're open or because they're more difficult procedures? Then you look at the randomized trials, right? And these haven't given us an answer. What I'm convinced of is that in surgery, we do randomized trials and we don't listen to them. You have the lung cancer study group comparing lobe versus wedge resection that it came out in, in the 1990s. And we are still not doing lobectomies on everyone. We do sublobar resections, we do segmentectomies, we do wedge resections. When we have this data that showed that lobectomy should be the standard. When we have nodal dissection versus nodal sampling, and we still say nodal dissection is what we should be doing. And now we have the reincarnation of the lung cancer study group, Dr. Al Torki's trial, the CALGB, comparing lobectomy to lesser resection for less than two centimeter lesions, and that data is almost out. I guarantee you we're not going to listen to it. 
we're going to do what we feel is right. If we think it's a lobectomy, we're going to do a lobectomy. If we think it needs a sublobar resection, we're going to do a sublobar resection. So this whole idea of using randomized trials for surgery, at least in thoracic surgery, I haven't found it successful. And we have a new paradigm that we're starting to investigate with at our own institution. But when you look at this, these numbers, really, you cannot come up with a conclusion. If you really wanted to do the correct randomized trial, you would require 385 patients uh, to have a power of 80 percent and uh, an alpha to, uh, of 0.05 to demonstrate a 10 percent difference in survival. And we just don't see that. Although a recent one just came out for gynecological surgery. And when we look at the literature, there's really nothing that says that VATS is better than open. All we have is the way we feel about it. So I said, all right, let's look at our own data. So when I was at Sloan Kettering, we looked at our own data. We found we did 741 lobectomies. We had different surgeons doing different surgeries. Uh, I was big on doing VATS lobectomy, and the other surgeons, the older ones, were doing them by thoracotomy. And we found that we can do it with a relatively good morbidity and mortality, and we found that we had equally balanced groups. Remember I told you if we do a randomized trial, we'd need these two, uh, types of numbers, and that's what we had. And what we found at the end, and they were well controlled based on comorbidities, et cetera, uh, and smoking, and in the end what we found was that there was really no difference in survival and a similar distribution of histology. And the main difference was the length of stay, five days versus seven days. And we took a little less nodal uh, nodes with the VATS procedure. And like I said, the amount of nodes you get is basically effort dependent. I don't think it's really technique dependent. And then the conversions uh, this is what I think is the important thing. When you look at the conversions, 17% conversion. But what was interesting, even though we looked through all of this, the thing that we missed, uh, so this is their survival, the thing that we missed were the major complications. Who needed a pneumonectomy when you were doing it VATS? Who ended up uh, ending up with a bilobectomy? Who ended up with a bad esophageal injury? And this was not in this data. And I didn't know that at the time that I published this. And then we published a second paper saying how great that lobectomy was. Yet we didn't have these major complications where patients actually got hurt. Right? And when you look at it, we control, we say, look, there's less complications and every and, and VATS is much better. Right? Looking at complications, the has the odds ratio, VATS had less complications. But it was with VATS, with robotic surgery, that we ended up having this, these major complications that were not reported in this series. Right? So with the robot, is the robot better? Oh, my God, you get better dissection. You, 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 you have 360 degrees of movement. And then when you look at it, right, this, these are, this was the old robot that I'm... Um, from back in uh, uh, about 15 years ago that I was doing. And this is around the bronchus. Wait a minute, I'm trying to go back. And, you know, when I'm trying to look at the robot in retrospect, I wanted to look at it and say, okay, what did the robot provide? And I'm here coming around an artery. And you know what? It's not magic. I come around the artery the same way with the robot, the way I come around with open, the way I come around with VATS, with the regular instrumentation. And it's not like the robot gives me so much more. And then the fissures are this way. And then you go in the bag. And it made me realize when I just look at it, the robot, VATS, open, you can do it either way you want. Nothing is magic, and you have to look at the data. So this is data published by one of my former partners, Dr. Park, that appeared in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery. And it's always important to look at the numbers. 184 robotic cases, 700 VATS cases, 1,100 open cases. Why are there so many open cases? 
Those are the more difficult ones. Those are the ones with the difficult body habits, with the short patient who's this wide. Those are the ones that are getting those difficult cases. When we show our videos, we are showing our best videos. We are showing there's a selection bias. And there's a selection bias in reporting VATS, and there's a selection bias in showing our videos. When you look at the videos, the surgeons here, I'm sure you go, oh wow, but it looks so easy on the video at the course. When you have that actual little fat patient in front of you and you, you're trying to dissect it and it's difficult and you don't know why you're having such a hard time, because that's real surgery. So you gotta be careful of what you hear at the conferences that we talk about and what you're actually seeing when you have a live patient that could bleed and die within your hands. So this is uh, what they published. They did a, uh, a, pro, uh, a propensity scored matched analysis. All right, so they try to say, okay, we have the same number of patients here and everything looks well grouped. The data is biased from the beginning. No matter whether you do a propensity score match analysis or a Cox proportional hazards analysis, the data is biased from the beginning. The easier patients are having the more robotic cases or the more VATS cases done. Right? And I actually wrote in a letter to the, uh, to the uh, journal talking about all the issues that I had with this case. And the main reason why I wanted to do that is because we know that with robotic surgery, with VAT surgery, patients get hurt. Patients have died using robotic surgery, and you don't hear about it. Da Vinci is a $62 billion company, $62 billion. And why is it that so many people are using robotics? Patients aren't asking for it, at least not in my practice. Why are we doing it? Because it's getting pushed. It's getting marketed by a company that profits from it. And you got to always keep that in the back of your mind. Why is it that I know of three, four deaths from robotic surgery and you don't see it in the literature at all? Yet we hear, oh, it does better. You have less complications, etc. Right? And I'm guilty of that. At the beginning, I was one of the people who was pushing that left and right. Yes, this is fantastic. They do better. And actually, I'll come back to the cost in a second. And then we published this paper where we found after we had published the first two papers that said VATS was so fantastic, less complications, then as I was going along, I kept hearing, oh, but so-and-so ended up having to do a pneumonectomy. So-and-so came across the main pulmonary artery. I'm like, I didn't know about that. How come we're not presenting that? So I looked for them. I went into the thoracotomy group and I found all those complications and I saw all the stuff that was happening. And I am sure I am missing some, right? As surgeons, it's not trying to hide things, but we have our fragile egos. And somehow if we have a complication, you kind of shove it away and you forget about it because it just doesn't allow you to keep moving forward. It doesn't allow you to keep, you know, progressing and taking care of other patients. But then I found these 13 complications and they weren't small. You've had three people that needed a pneumonectomy. You had a splenectomy. You had injury to the esophagus. You had injury to the airways. Yet, I have two papers before this one that says that VATS did so much better, that VATS was uh, less complicated, and that that's the procedure that we should be doing. Is it worth it? to do a VATS procedure, VATS lobectomy on 100 patients, if you know that one of those are going to get a pneumonectomy, or two of them are going to get a pneumonectomy because of bleeding, was it worth it to do those 100 patients? Now, I don't think it's a guarantee every 100 patients are going to get a pneumonectomy, but it's something to think about. And what I realized as a young surgeon, which I'm not anymore, but when I was a young surgeon, I was pushing it for a number of reasons. That's how I was making a name. That's how I was promoting myself in a very competitive field in New York City. So who was I doing the VATS lobectomies for? Was I doing it for the patients or was I doing it for me? And now when you're looking at these new techniques that we have with robotics, et cetera, 
It takes longer, that's a fact. And then the question is, is it more cost effective? There's a, this is a paper that I did with Dr. Park who had written that, uh, comparing VATS robotic and open. And what we found was that VATS was the cheapest. Robotic was actually expen more expensive if you look over here. And I still don't understand where these, this data comes from. So when I look at this, ro right, uh, if we just take four days, Robotic is the most expensive. So when we're pushing the robot, we're adding time, we're adding money. And when I look at the procedure technically, it's the same thing. I, I don't think it's any different. Now you're going to get a lot of people who say, yes, but you have this and you have the 360 degrees. I, I'm just not buying it and I'm not seeing it in the data. And then you want to look at data to see, is there a difference between uh, VATS and open. And this is a quality of life one from Sloan. And what's interesting, when you look at the mental components of it, the blue line, the thoracotomy patients actually had a better mental component. When you look at the pain, it wasn't that different. Four days, maybe a little better with the VATS. And long-term pain, it's no different. So what's the best way to explain VATS versus open? Is it just a cosmetic operation? Uh, at a year, they look about the same. At six months, they look about the same. And I know it may throw people since I'm very much a VATS person, but I think we do have to keep our feet on the ground and think about why are we doing it? Is VATS and robotics better than thoracotomy? Has our thoracotomies improved with time? We're making shorter incisions. We use epidurals. Uh, and, you know, why are we doing it VATS? And the most important thing is to make sure that you're safe. Can we do it VATS? Yes. Can we do it robotically? Yes. Can we do it from up here? Can we do it from up here? Yes. You can take out a gallbladder through the vagina. Should we be doing it? Right? People are reporting things left and right. Should we be doing it? And the most important thing is safety. And I want to leave you with this last message. This past month, and a paper appeared in the New England Journal, actually two papers. And it also appeared in the New York Times where a group from MD Anderson did a randomized control trial for cervical cancer where they did surgery. And it was randomized to 300 patients in each group. And what they found was that the minimally invasive group, which was both laparoscopic and robotic, had a worse overall survival and a higher recurrence rate to the point where now in the United States the FDA is intervening to say that robotic procedures do not provide anything more. In Bogota, Colombia, the National Cancer Institute now, they have stopped doing minimally invasive procedures and are doing it open now for cervical cancer. So that is something to think about. We are all biased here. We're all VATS. The fact that you're coming to this course means that you're pro-VATS. All of us here are pro-VATS. But in the end, we're scientists as well. And we have to look at this data. And this new data that has come out about cervical cancer is very compelling. And I think we have to keep checking ourselves. If not, you're going to get an external body that are checking us like the FDA. And so this is the main thing. Just be safe. Thank you for the opportunity to listen to this presentation. I hope uh, you all understood uh, what Raya Flores talked about, and I want to confirm. And I think we all feel and know this that independent from access, the main thing during surgery is uh, the safety of the patient. If we see high risks of intra -op or post-op risks, this has to be 